Hello, and welcome to Coffee Conversations. My name is Heidi Ellsworth, and I'm with Roofers Coffee Shop, and we are so proud to bring our coffee conversations to all of you out there. Thank you for being on this morning. We have an amazing panel. Um, it is... <laughs> We're going to be looking at third quarter, what's been happening, looking forward into 2022, and we've brought some of the best leaders in the industry on um, Coffee Conversations this morning to share what they're seeing and share some of their wisdom. So I am so excited about this morning. Before we get started, I do want to say a special thank you to John Smanville. Um, John's Manville is our sponsor this morning, a leader in the industry. Um, I have to tell you, I'm always so humbled by what John's Manville is doing out there for their contractors, being a part of it, really helping to navigate so much of what's going on right now. And so um, special thanks to them. Of course, you can always find John's Manville on Rivers Coffee Shop in their directory and with their articles. Um, some videos are out there from the last IRE. So all kinds of good information um, to help you get in touch with them. But we are really um, honored this morning to have Jennifer Ford Smith on the panel, who is also um, in charge of the sponsorship. So thank you, Jenny. Thank you for being here. Um, we're going to have this, everyone introduce themselves. And so Jennifer, I'd love to start with you. Oh, thank you, Heidi. It's great to see everybody's faces out there, um, although I only see the panelists. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, Jay, I'm really excited to be a sponsor of this um, opportunity to have a, a very candid discussion about what's going on in the marketplace. Uh, for, for many of you that don't know, JM is uh, over 160 years old, and uh, we have uh, three divisions, but we are rooted in roofing. We started there 160 years ago, uh, making the very first shingle ever. So uh, while we're not in the shingle business any longer, and we focus on commercial roofing only, um, like I said, we're rooted there, and we're really excited to be able to come talk about what we see in Q3, as well as uh, what we see into the future of 2022. And I know that's uh, certainly a hot topic, topic on everybody's mind. So um, just for myself, um, I am the Director of Product Management Marketing, and I also have responsibility for our owner services team, which is a, a relatively new organization within JM that we've been building over the last year. Uh, prior to that, I did run our sales organization for the U.S., and I've been with JM for about 20 years. Um, it's been a very good organization to work with, um, and many of our employees, one of my favorite statistics is that uh, we have about 8,000 employees, and the last uh, we kind of looked at it, uh, 1,500 of them have been with the company for more than 20 years or longer. So uh, that speaks volumes to what a great company is. I'm happy to be a part of it, and uh, like I said, I'm looking forward to our conversation today. Thanks, Heidi. That is great. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, I'm just so happy you're here today. And I'm, I can't, this is going to be, you, Megan Ellsworth is in the background, as you all know. And when we were practicing, she was like, this is going to be the best coffee conversations ever. So just, this is going to be excellent. And to introduce, I would also like to have Daryl Kratzer with National Roofing Partners to um, introduce yourself, sir. Thanks, Heidi. I'm uh, honored to be here again, especially with such an elite panel that you put together. I kind of feel humbled, but uh, I'm, I'm excited to be here. Uh, a little bit about NRP. Uh, we're, we're a roll-up of over 200 different partners that, that provide services throughout all 50 states, including Hawaii and uh, Alaska. And uh, we're, we're, we're focused on our client. We're focused on delivering results, and we do it with passion, and we do it with humility. So we're excited to be here and we'll look forward to the conversation. That is great. Thank you so much. It, it's going to be great. And I would also like to then introduce Will Lorenz. Um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Hi, Heidi. Um, I'm Will Lorenz, uh, Vice President at General Coatings. Uh, we manufacture spray foam and roof coatings. I'm also a president of the RCMA, the Roof Coating Manufacturers Association, representing around 80 supplier and manufacturers of roof coatings, uh, acrylics, bituminous, silicones, and urethanes. And uh, so I wear two hats and uh, proud to represent roof coatings here today too. Um, General Coatings, we're in the spray foam business and uh, we do both roofing and insulation products. 
as well as the roof coatings. And so just glad to be here and be a part of this uh, fun group and uh, talk about the future, see what's going on. I love it. I love it. Thank you so much for being here today. And Adam Oaks with Estimating Edge, please introduce yourself. Well, thanks, Adi. Thanks for including uh, me in the edge. Um, so I'm Adam Oaks, CEO of, of Estimating Edge. Um, we provide an Indian software solution for the roofer, the commercial roofing market. So I didn't know how much Jennifer and I had in common. <laughs> I come from a sales background, ran sales. Um, our business is all commercial. And also our employees, the, the average tenure is about 15 to 20 years. <laughs> we're, we're a 30 year old company. So it's, it's neat to hear that. Um, but our end to end solution starts with takeoff and estimating, includes uh, job tracking, uh, employee time uh, tracking, and uh, really strong data, data solutions to help people uh, win more work. That's what we do. Excellent. Excellent. Um, thank you all for being here today. We've got some great topics in front of us. I want to remind everyone out there that this is a Q&A, questions and answers. We want your participation. So in your control panel, you can send a um, chat or a question to Megan as we go along. And if you want to come on the show, we'll bring you on. Um, you can be on video if you want, or we can ask the question for you, or you can just be on audio. We don't care. However you want to do it, we want you involved. So Please do not forget to ask your questions as we kind of go through all this. Um, so we are going to start with Adam and he has brought, um, if you remember from our last panel where we um, looked at what was happening on second quarter, we are now kind of going to look at what's happened since then. And so Adam, you have pulled some great data for us. Can you talk about this? Sure. I, I mean, um... As, as I spoke about last time, it's always surprising to see the bids keep going up with all the economic fluctuations that are happening. But this is normalized data, and this is specific commercial roofing bids. Um, and you can see, you know, 2019 in the yellow, 2020 in the green, and then more recently, uh, 2021 in the red. And, uh, you know, there's normal tracking with the summer months and so forth, but bids keep climbing. I guess the only real question for the team here is what's happening to all the bids, right? Where are the starts? Um, uh, you know, what, where are the delays? And, and I think that's what we're going to talk about today is what is happening to us after we bid those jobs. Uh, you know, looking at this, it, it just, the fact that you can see how far ahead we are between 2020 and 2021 and that it's just staying so consistent yeah. is really has said a lot to me. So maybe we'll start, take this over to Jennifer, you know, really kind of talking about this as you're talking to the contractors, I know you just had some um, summits. You're, you're, I saw you at all the shows with the contractors. Um, what are you hearing about bids and then also just job completion and getting through all that? Yeah, you know, when I look at the trends month over month for 2021, we really started out pretty slow um, in January and February. Um, and then um, we kind of took off in March and, and that would be expected because if you think back to March 2020, that's really when the economy shut down. Um, so you would expect those high growth rates uh, across the roofing membranes and polyiso. Uh, but, but to the point, uh, it, it hasn't stopped. Um, and I think people uh, certainly have been concerned about getting supply. And so what we're really struggling with is what's real out there and, and uh, what is what you would say panic buying, right? And um, we will continue, you know, I think people are gonna continue to be concerned about supply and continue to buy as much as they can. And, you know, we certainly are working to make as much as we can available. Um, we see a very strong Q3. Um, and uh, we, you know, we are seeing strong growth in well into 2022 based on uh, what our contractors are um, telling us. So right now it's all about getting the material on the job site so that the work can be done and um, in, in, to continue that trend and growth. And, and really where we're seeing it is there's some rebounding going on in the new construction realm. Um, roofing, we can usually normalize things because a lot of us do both re-roofing and new construction, um, but we are still seeing a boom with, especially in building size with the big warehouses and distribution centers. So 
um, over the last 10 years, if, if you just look at our historic size of job as a company, it has grown tremendously as the warehouse um, sector has continued to grow with more online um, buying and whatnot. So um, like I said, we, we see a real strong Q3 and four well into 2022, as long as we can get supply out there. So Daryl, kind of looking at that from your side of the picture with 200 um, roofing companies out there and doing things, what are you seeing? Well, you know, it's interesting. The, uh, the activity continues to be very strong. In fact, just to give you a one quick example, one of the major big box retailers historically over the past three years is, is uh, re-roofed or recovered uh, probably 100 facilities. Their goal for 2022 is to do 350. So you can wow. see the demand is really ramped up and, and hopefully, uh, Jennifer, you guys are going to be able to make the stuff that we can. And <laughs> uh, you know, one of the things we're seeing as well, too, is a pivoting by our partners, uh, looking at uh, different opportunities besides re-roofing, um, even making some changes relative to the type of system that's going down with, with the single plies being so hard to come by. We're starting to see a reemergence of some of the modifieds and some of the built ups. We're also seeing a whole big uh, a switch over into a coding aspect of it or just nothing more than just repairing it. You know, we, when we did our practice round, I told you about my five R's of roofing, the, the <laughs> repair, replace, recover, restore, or refrain. Well, we're seeing a whole lot of the first three. Uh, and that's kind of the pivot that I think everyone's made. And it's uh, service business is just going through the roof right now. Yeah, I've been hearing the exact same thing. The service, you know, just how do you keep the roof tight? How do, how do you take care of your customers when you can't always get all the materials on the roof? But Will, what are you seeing? Because you have, um, I mean, you're looking at both spray foam and coatings and all of your coating associations as part of the RCMA. Yes, uh, everything is, is strong on, on demand. I think that's the great news for all of us. Um, I think the challenge is that demand continues to outstrip supply. So uh, there's no ability for the suppliers to catch up. They're running flat out. And uh, if they have any sequencing problems or problems getting enough raw materials, which we've all been facing, um, we can't meet up with the demand. So it's kind of rolling the demand into 22, which is going to continue to uh, you know, present strong opportunities for, for growth, but it's also going to be a challenge on, on availability of materials. So I look at there's sort of three factors going on. Demand is still ahead of supply. Uh, and then the second thing, as I would say, is our ports and our transportation uh, is still functioning poorly. Um, there's not enough truckers to get things delivered. There's not enough uh, flow through at the ports. There's not enough uh, storage space for the containers that are coming off the ports. Um, so a lot of what would might catch us up is, is being bottlenecked there. And then the third thing is there's some recent challenges with uh, China and their energy policies over there affecting a lot of the raw materials that come out of China. I think most people don't know that about 50% of the, the chemicals and plastics raw material come out of China. And uh, with China having an energy crisis, what they've done is they've reduced uh, the energy uh, available for the heavy industries and that's caused them to reduce their rates which has uh, reduced supply on a lot of the components that all of us use in the in the roofing business and so it's going to have uh, challenges that are going to ripple into 22 if not into 23 depending on when the Chinese decide to kind of solve their problem. Wow and you know kind of um Globally, Will, you were talking about this before. Globally, I mean, China, but we have some other areas, right, that we're just seeing some um, hard times getting the materials that we need. That is true. Uh, you know, uh, I think people have seen that oil prices have surged up again. So again, all our raw materials are, are affected in that oil sequence uh, for the most part. Um, but, you know, our, our ports in the United States, uh, have recovered from the COVID, but uh, they're just all backed up. And, uh, you know, they're just not the flow through to be able to get it out. And the rail services are full and the trucking, uh, you know, they need a million more drivers. And, uh, and so that's 
making a challenge about getting materials to contractors or out of distribution centers to uh, to locations, and and it's just a persistent challenge. And and I think the president is now addressing uh, some of the issues with regard to the ports and uh, you know trying to make Christmas happen. Uh, well, he's going to prioritize important things, holiday gifts, medical, food, uh, roofing supplies, and chemicals are probably going to be lower on the list. So we may not catch up in the next fourth quarter. So. I, I think everybody should buy local and let the roofing materials come in. So <laughs> there you go. <laughs> there you go. Um, well, as so I'm really curious to kind of follow that track too on the trucking and the logistics. So Daryl, when you are um, visiting with your contractors, I've been hearing that there's been some great solutions where the industry is really starting to work together. Contractors are working together to figure out trucking, going back and forth and a, a lot of different things. What are you hearing along that lines? No, I think you're spot on. I think uh, the uh, the ability of the partners to actually collaborate together uh, and be able to come up with solutions is probably the best I've ever seen it in my 40 years in the industry. And so it's pretty exciting to see competitors even uh, helping each other to make sure that we're able to get the supply that we need. Um, you know, the one thing that we're not even mentioning right now, and, and I think is a real concern is, is labor, uh, because uh, in essence, with this COVID mandate, you're starting to already see what's happening to someone like Southwest Airlines, or I know many other companies. And in any federal projects, you've got to be vaccinated. And, and unfortunately, it's going to cause a real strain on uh, an already short labor force. So we're very concerned about that as well, too. You know, Darrell, yeah, I saw, I saw that um, 22,000 jobs were added to the construction industry in September. But when you look at non-residential construction, we're way, still way below pre-pandemic levels. There's a long way to go. Yep. Yeah, and Adam, I, we just, yesterday, I was visiting with um, actually the chief economist with Angie, and they were talking about how other segments are actually, people are leaving, so they're having a lot of excesses out of um, other hospitalities, other segments, and that that should be opening up people to, for us to recruit into construction. But I don't know if any of you are seeing that or Adam, if you've heard anything along those lines. Well, I can only speak for us. We're, we're having people come from all sorts of industries applying for positions with us, but you know, we're a technology company, not a, mm -hmm. not a roofing company, obviously, supporting this industry. Um, I'd be curious what, what Daryl's seeing on that. Yeah, you know, one of the things that happened just in our local market right now is you've got Amazon just exploding at Amazon, paying people 15 bucks an hour. And it's just, uh, you know, what do you want to do? You want to get up on a roof in Dallas, Texas in the middle of the summer, or do you want to work inside an air-conditioned warehouse? Uh, it's pretty, it's pretty, pretty easy choice. Uh, yeah. That's one of the biggest bids we see come in are data centers. <laughs> a lot of that. One of the bigger macro pictures is there's still about 15 or 18 million people that, that went out of the job market on, on a federal level um, and that they're not getting back employed. They're choosing not to. And, uh, you know, they could be in the roofing trade. They could be in a lot of trades that help make uh, the economy roll better. But, you know, people are choosing to pass on working right now. Uh, and that's unfortunate. We we need it all across our sectors. Yeah. Jennifer, what are you seeing from with, um, I mean, you could look at it from both sides with all of your contractors, but also JM has huge manufacturing plants. I mean, you hire what, a lot yes. of people. Yeah, you know, I agree uh, uh, wholeheartedly with Daryl and, and the other panelists, you know, we're struggling with labor equally um, from, from a manufacturing standpoint, but, you know, even in, in our corporate offices, right? I think, you know, they're calling this time the great resignation, as Will uh, mentioned, and a lot of folks are are leaving leaving because childcare is an example. They can't make enough money to cover that, right? And so they're opting to stay at home. Uh, we're seeing that in manufacturing as well. Um, and what we're doing is looking at all the different, you know, policies that we have in place to try to be more flexible where we can be. Um, and I know from a roofing contractor standpoint, that's really hard because you can't put a roof on unless you're up on the roof, right? Mm -hmm. Certainly for 
uh, some of these more corporate roles, it, you can be, uh, you know, work from home and we're, we're looking at all of those policies, but you know, when it comes to running a line, you gotta be there. And, but how can we be more flexible uh, with the way our shifts are configured or how can we be more flexible with vacation time? Um, Cause I think it does go well beyond just the salary portion of it as well, which is something we certainly are looking at. Um, but you know, we, we continue to struggle um, and certainly, um, with the mandate, you know, we've certainly got feedback in some of our plant locations that, you know, being the company size that we are, that we may lose some people if if we're obviously well over a hundred uh, person employee uh, employee company, um, and so that's a big risk for us as well. So. Um, very concerning. Um, I, I love what the industry is doing, though, to come together with things like pro certification and, you know, really putting roofing out there as an honorable place to work. And I think NRCA is doing some great things to to really try to bring that to the forefront with some of the stuff Reed is doing out there as well. You know, yeah. Jennifer, just if I could tag right on the top of that also, ABC is very actively involved in that as well, too. For those of you who were able to be at the best of success, I know um, uh, Steve Little and Tony Rader, they uh, rolled out the new apprentice training program that has been funded. And I, I think that's gonna be the kind of stuff that we're gonna really see the need to uh, the need for going forward so that we're able to come up with a labor force that we need. But, uh, you know, a lot of people don't need to go to a four year university anymore to make the kind of money that they wanna make. And there's yeah. no reason. Yeah. And it was interesting, Heidi, um, I think we'll all appreciate this, but I was watching the news this morning and they were talking about the trucking industry and the people applying look a lot different today than maybe they had done historically. And they had said they were getting a lot more young people applying and a lot more women applying um, to be owner operators. And they really promoted the fact that some of these drivers can make $120,000 a year if they're owner operators, right? And, you know, I think, roofing has that same ability and we have great career paths and we have a great opportunity to talk more about that to to the young folks that are entering the marketplace today and being really proactive with that and getting out there and i mean i know nrca roofing alliance I, i'm hearing it across the board but um and new training that's going on um down in arizona with um henry Staggs. he's working on training there's a lot of different folks that are um working on that i think you're right. We have to come together and help support each other. And then getting that into the pro certification, that just makes everyone look great. Um, one of the things that we're also seeing and that we're talking about is, and I have a question that's going to go along with this. It just came up. But um, one of the things that we're hearing is people are being, or people, roofing companies are being creative on switching pr on products, systems, trying to figure out how to put there. So we did have a question that just came up that I thought was really interesting. And it's from Stephen Holman. And he asks, is anyone seeing a trend in roof coatings using zinc free water based acrylic coating technology? So, well, I'm gonna hand that over to you. <laughs> well, thank you. I, I think uh, as a whole, first of all, roof coatings are up. Uh, significantly over 19. It's hard to judge 20 because of COVID, um, but they're up dramatically. And, uh, you know, environmentally, uh, a zinc-free coating is is desired. I know that particularly in, in the West, California, Washington, there's, uh, you know, legislation and direction to, to be that, uh, get rid of heavy metals and so forth, make your coatings durable, but yet uh, zinc-free. And uh, so I see the demand growing. I, I think the, the challenge is that, you know, right now on the roof coating, people are just trying to get enough roof coating, uh, whether it's acrylics or bituminous or silicone, and uh, do the jobs. We're, we're certainly seeing, uh, as Daryl kind of pointed out, where some owners are choosing because of the delays and availability of, let's say, a complete re-roof, they're choosing other options to extend the life use roof coatings and then uh, get to it when they think it is either going to be more cost effective or able to be done in a swift, more uniform manner, whether that's 22 or 23. So uh, uh, I think that's what we're seeing. And acrylics are a great part of that solution. And uh, particularly if you have a built up roofs, they're, they're a great restoration system over that. You know, Heidi, also, to give, I want to give Jennifer a little cover here because it's not just the roofing manufacturers. 
I mean, faster, the isocyanurate, the different insulations needed. So we're seeing some of our partners that are actually changing out the ISO for, say, a lightweight concrete where they can utilize the EPS board to still get the great R value that's required uh, and doing different type of systems that eliminate fast. So, I mean, they're getting creative and uh, coming up with whatever they can to make sure that they can satisfy the uh, the, end, the client because that, at the end of the day, is what we all strive to do, focus on our client and provide them what they need. Right. Jennifer, are you seeing, uh, seeing kind of the same thing with your contractors of different accessories or different substrates or what's trying to kind of work around some of um, this material shortages? Yeah, I mean, and it's it's difficult because even in a fully adhered system, um, you, you need a fastener, right? And that's becoming the the bottleneck. Um, so one of the things that we've seen some big clients who are are desperate to get in their buildings and get them operational. Um, most of them are new construction. They have metal decks, um, so they've been using our self adhered um, vapor barriers out there just to get a temp roof in. Um, uh, to give them, buy them a little bit more time because some most of those systems can be exposed to UV for up to 90 days, right? So it gives them some ability to get the roof dried in and uh, get their building operational while they wait for some of the bottleneck items, whether it be polyiso or um, um, polyiso or fasteners uh, to show up on the job site. So that's an option that we've seen. Um, FM doesn't let you adhere directly to a metal deck, uh, but as an example, JM has uh, uh, guaranteed systems that are non-FM approved in that manner. So we have plenty of data that we're comfortable that that works. So um, we're recommending if if people want to get you know started on their system, if they really clean the metal deck, they can use urethane adhesives to attach their their ISO down to the deck, and then uh, build their roof from there. So that's that's an alternative, and and early on that may not have been the greatest alternative because your things use MDI, right? But I think we feel like MDI is starting to free up a little bit more than fasteners, so that certainly can be an option. Um, but yeah, because we sell systems, and because our, we're so complicated as an industry when it comes to code approvals, um, it's it's been very challenging to find alternates. And so yes, you do see some folks asking to extend their warranties for a couple of years by coating the roof, if, if the roof's in good enough shape to do that. So um, we're trying to pull all everything out of the hats that we can to try to give options out there and work with our contractors to, to keep their crews busy and keep them working. Wow, that's great. Well, we have a question. I'd like to put this towards, um, it, kind of, it goes along, along the same lines here, but I'd like to put this towards Adam. Um, this is from Kyle Chrisman. Thank you so much, Kyle. Um, he says, um, could you comment on how innovation will affect the roofing industry given the current labor crunch? And so, um, Adam, I know you're part of RT3, as are a lot of us, and this is really innovation and what we're doing to help the labor crunch is a huge issue. Yeah, I, I think the same thing when I think of, of technology is around what can we do about labor? Because this isn't going to end, right? So automation is is what we're thinking here at Estimating Edge. And I look, I, I was doing some research, and we see that we're people are spending money in technology right now is digital collaboration, safety and wearables, and BIM. Uh, and and when you talk about models, that's going to play a part in automation, the solution we've got coming soon. So what we what we're talking about, at least on the pre-construction side is automating part of the estimating process, which would allow customers to do you know, more with less people. And we can, you know, it, it's hard to find new estimators. Every, we get calls every day saying, do you know what an estimator that's looking for a job? And just like that on the field, it's no different. So we think we can eliminate up to 80% of the time it might take to take off and estimate a project using some automation that's actually coming very soon. We should be able to announce something in the, next, in, in the coming weeks. Uh, we're really excited about it. Um, so we think that that's the path that we can help. But but actually going back to labor for just a second, we've hired five people in the last week. Um, we've, we've been hiring a lot of people lately. 50% of people we're hiring are veterans. And I'll mm -hmm. speak, I'm a veteran. So uh, I, I tell you what, there's a lot of people out there that don't know how to get a job in the private industry. They're retired or they've left after all these wars we've been having. And they're out there. So if, if you look, you'll you'll find some pretty good people at all levels that can help you in the organization. So I wanted to throw that out there too. 
That's great. That is exactly. Um, Gerald, um, on, on both of those, I love the talking about hiring veterans and what Jenny said about um, more women, you know, it's always a passion of mine to get more women into roofing, but also what are you seeing innovation wise, technology wise um, with your contractors? Um, I know you're doing a lot with drones and I'd love to share how some of those things are, start, what you're seeing and what's starting to help. Yeah, no, and let me just address what he just said about veterans and yours about women. I think there's three of us guys in the office here at our corporate headquarters. So we are surrounded by women. And I got to tell you, it makes a major difference in the thought process and the collaboration within this one on. So uh, I think that's a, Adam, that's an outstanding idea relative to the veterans and the women in roofing. As far as technology, we, we kind of pioneered a ability through the drone technology, which the drone is nothing more of going out and capturing the photos, but we've developed software in conjunction with a partner that uh, we are actually able to cut 80% of the roof assessment out. So in other words, you can fly it, you can get all the dimensions, you can get every penetration on the roof, and then, oh, by the way, we can identify the deficiency. So really, the only thing needed from boots on a roof is someone to go up and cut a core because no matter what they tell you that's up there, you always need to confirm that because half the time it's not what they said it was. Uh, and so that's one of the things that our partners are really utilizing to help them kind of uh, be able to do more with less, if you will. Yeah, I, you know, one of the big things that um, I'm just waiting for, because, you know, innovation in the U.S., in Americans, when, when there's a problem, innovation is going to come in and it's that, that private is going to come up. So, Will, as, I, as we're kind of looking at this, um, robotics on the roof has to be a trend that we're going to be looking at in 2022. Um, we, I, we actually had um, folks stop by our booth at IRE asking about some of those possibilities um, that they're working on. What are you hearing along that lines? Well, I, I think there's twofold. One, I, I, first I hope that uh, we get a little bit more automated drivers so we can get the materials to the roof. So uh, so Daryl has the product there. Um, uh, you know, we have all reservations about uh, self-driving vehicles, but on, on the other hand, uh, they're necessary and, and uh, you know, uh, but as far as automation on the roof, I think that's where the current bottleneck really is as far as innovation. Um, you know, humans are capable of doing many things and observing many things. Um, but, I, uh, you know, spray foam, we have robotics that can spray out things. Coatings can be applied with, with machines that have been around for 20, 30 years. But, uh, you know, basically, you know, we need to look at innovations that's going to replicate a lot of manual labor duties and as i observe people on the roof there's many tasks that people do so you know you just can't have a steamer be just a machine because they do so many things in, in ensuring that it's applied right or, or sealed properly and uh, so we're kind of waiting for that robot if you will to to do that i've seen some videos of people developing ones that could install drywall well if they can install drywall this this computer, uh, this uh, robot can get up on a roof and maybe shingle too. Um, so we're gonna hope, but I think we're still five years away or so from a lot of those innovations getting there. Um, the biggest thing is, you know, trying to to get efficiencies on on the employees so that they're trained well, so the defects are low, so they install things right the first time, and then uh, get their speed of of installation up because we sequence all the things behind it so uh, you know they can do their task efficiently. So I, that's the trend I think we're seeing. Yeah, I I, I keep hearing that too, and a lot of people talking about you know the better um, application, the spray foam um, well, or coatings um, tools to be able to put that together. And we're also seeing it we're seeing it in a lot of the single plies, in the mod bits, in different machinery that's laying that. Are you, what are you seeing, Jennifer? Um, with your contractors? Are they trying to kind of automate the rooftop? I think innovation in our industry just comes in due time, right? So I don't, I, I think it's hard in the roofing industry to say we're going to be in Amazon and be fully automated in, you know, two years. Uh, but if you just look at the history, right, if, if, if anyone has, and I have swung a, a mop that weighed 80 pounds with hot asphalt that's 450 degrees, right, that's 
to see where we are. And that's how we evolved into single ply systems. And the early single ply systems had a lot of tapes and primers, which added labor. Then you got into the thermoplastics, right? And so those are all huge innovations on improving labor. Um, and I would say the, uh, the, the latest ones in our industry, which are actually not that brand new, are the, like the high density polyiso boards because they're so much lighter as a cover board than a gypsum board. Or um, most recently, the canister adhesives. Um, we've seen tremendous labor um, improvement on uh, application methods with those types of canisters versus traditional adhesives. So I see innovation every, um, you know, every year in our industry. It's just not that big, you know, robot that's uh, taking a, you still need that human element. But, you know, I have a lot of optimism that we have a creative industry and that we're, you know, every year we make a step closer to, to automating uh, the labor process out there. Yeah, I well, and I have to say, we just, um, John Walker, thank you for your comment. He said, absolutely, contractors are doing everything they can to find other options. Yeah. So the more creative all the manufacturing, distribution, service providers, technology, the more creative it can be, I think the contractors are open to it. <laughs> they're, they're, wanting to, they're wanting solutions to come through. Um, so I, one of the things, just to kind of um, change up the topic just a little bit, but I want to talk a tad bit about roofing restoration versus replacement versus, uh, you know, Daryl's five R's. Um, because it feels like, and I, I really want to kind of take it more from the um, owner's side of it, the building owner's facility management. What are they looking for um, right now? And what are you seeing as the trends? What is the feedback? I mean, Daryl, I'm going to start with you because you were when we were talking about customer budgets. How, how are we doing that right now? So talk about some of the things you're seeing there and, and some of this, if there are any solutions that you're seeing from the contractors. Well, at the end of the day, the client wants a dry environment. And so whatever we can do to provide them that, that's what they're all in for. Uh, we, we, we've got customers right now that recognize the shortage, recognize how the material prices is just, quite frankly, you don't even know what it's going to be by the time you get it shipped to you. So you can't really plan for it. So we have a, a lot of major customers that are saying, can you buy me two, can you buy me five, can you buy me 10 years by either doing coatings or doing restoration of flashings, uh, reinforcing the penetrations. I mean, think about it, 80% of roof failures is around the perimeter and around penetration, it's not the membrane. So if we can focus on those areas and buy time and get them the two, five or 10 year warranty they're looking for, then that's what we're, we're doing and I think, uh, if you can be able to offer that to a customer, then you're going to have them for life because they're ultimately, you have had their best interest in mind. You've got them a dry environment. You've done it in an economical fashion. And then when things turn around, then you've got a customer for life. I agree. So, Will, what are you seeing along that? Well, I think the same thing that Daryl's seeing, which is, you know, they've got an existing roof up there. It's likely have a, a fair amount of insulation. If they tear off that roof, they're going to have to move back up to code. And as we've seen, code has is, is moved up insulation requirements. So again, it's a double challenge on the availability of, of those isocyanate polyiso boards or EPS boards. Um, so, you know, if you've got an existing roof system and you can put uh, a recover system on it with, let's say, spray foam on top of it, add some insulation, seal up the deck, and then put roof coatings on top of it. Or if it's just a good roof in, in pretty good condition, but it's kind of at the end of its service life, uh, restoration systems over membranes or built up or over metal, you know, waterproof it, weatherproof it, keep it running, and uh, and then it can be done you know, at the end of that service life or whenever the client has the funds to be able to do it. I think there's still, you know, concern coming into 22 and 23 that, you know, are people going to occupy back uh, buildings again, you know, come back into corporate headquarters? And if they don't get there, um, are those entities that own the buildings going to spend the amount of money on on maintenance and, and uh, roofing and other things uh, to maintain it? like they would if they had a paying client in it. Um, certainly warehousing has gone crazy because I think everybody's taken the toilet paper effect where they're they're gonna stock up on everything and control their own warehousing. So warehousing's taken off, but 
really where is commercial uh, real estate and uh, and those buildings going to be. And and I think that's where coatings and spray foam are great alternatives because they can uh, give that person an extension on their roof life without having to worry about uh, you know whether they're going to have a client and and to be able to pay for the upgrades. Yeah, I and Jennifer, I know you work with building owners all over. Um, you have great relationships. What are you kind of hearing from them on, and especially I would think service and maintenance. Um, yeah, I, you know, I think um, for the most part we are, you know, working with people to get um, ex extend the life of their roof if if it makes sense, you know, but to Daryl's point, people are looking in on the new construction side, they're looking, you know, for just some certainty, and it's just a really uncertain time, right, they want to be watertight, they want to know what their budget's going to be, and they want to know when their material's going to arrive, and, um, you know, we've just really amped up the communication, and it's just communicate, 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 and um, we've had some of our, our bigger national accounts that once upon a time, it was a very a kind of secretive process, and we've asked them to be as open as possible because the more visibility that we have coming uh, from them, that it helps us plan together. And so that's that's all I can you know reiterate with folks. You know, I I may not be able to just give you a solid date and a solid price at you know of something that's going to happen in July of 2022. But um, the more visibility and the more uh, we can communicate and work as a partner, I think it'll be it'll mean success for for both both of us. So um, yeah, it's it's certainly been a really challenging time from that standpoint. Yeah, really, it's about communications, communications mm -hmm. and creativity is really what it's, it's all coming down to across the board. And so I'd I'd kind of like to and maybe um. Adam, we can start with you on this. I, I, I do want to get, you guys all have such great insights about um, what's happening on the federal level, right, with regulations and with everything that's going on. And so um, we're getting a lot of great comments and a lot of great questions. And, and it's kind of going back to how do we get more people, how do we hire? How do we get them back to work? Um, workforce is leaving. How, you know, what do we need to do? So Adam, maybe some thoughts on legislation, what we're seeing happening in DC and also regulations. So a couple of things. One, you know, I think uh, Will mentioned federal government's getting involved with the ports. So moving them to 24 hours is gonna be impactful and sometimes that's what it takes. But the other thing that we're seeing right now is gas prices. I think we all know the petroleum effect on our products. <laughs> and as those products go up to $100 a barrel, which is, seems to be likely, uh, that's going to cause another problem in the supply chain. So I think opening up the reserves, um, finding a way to keep those prices down, it's going to have a big impact on helping us get through this that we're clearly going through into next year. So those are a couple of things that I think would be important. Yeah, yeah. Well, you're really involved um, with Roofpack and with the NRCA, as is Jennifer and Daryl. So I want all of you. So, Will, what are you seeing? Well, I think we've got the infrastructure bill kind of hung up in, in Congress again. You know, it's it's dysfunctional again there, no matter who's in charge. And uh, and so, you know, I know there's pieces in there that could benefit the roofing industry, uh, kind of sustain demand into 23 and 24 if we we're doing uh, federal projects for all of us in, in, in roofing. And, uh, you know, it's really hopeful that that thing can pass and provide some stability. Um, again, it's, these are big dollar items. So, you know, the effects on the economy long term are going to be challenged. But, uh, you know, we need that infrastructure. There's a lot of things that, again, if the trucks can't get over the roads and the bridges, they're not delivering to the job site. So we need to maintain those things and we need to have a balance there. So that, along with just, again, federal oversight. Uh, on regulations that could impact starting with the chemicals and plastics industry that feed into the roofing products. Um, you know, we need smart regulation there. We don't need over-regulation. And um, I think that will help uh, allow us to, uh, you know, invest more in the United States. I think there's a reason why China and everything became the source for a lot of our petrochemicals business is because it was cheaper and easier to put it in there, less regulation, lower cost and so we need to build better build back in america here 
and the government has to be less of an obstacle to that and uh, allow us all these industries, whether they're producing isocyanates, uh, to be able to manufacture those back here in the United States uh, so that we can make polyiso and, and other products. Wow. Yeah, Daryl? Yeah, I think uh, your comment relative to the NRCA and the root pack and what Reed Ribble's doing is, is huge because, you know, one of the things that we also look at is, is part of uh, bringing our 200 plus tier one contracts together in a cross section so that they can become the voice of the national market. Uh, and that way we can talk to these politicians. I and mean, if you think about it, you got thousands of employees and that's what politicians listen to. So we need to get actively involved. We need to make a difference. We need to make sure that the issues that we're dealing with are being addressed. And I thought that uh, what the NRCA did uh, in Reed Ribble's, uh, Reed Ribble's leadership was outstanding. So we just need to make sure that we support that and we continually uh, get involved because the root pack, I think, can really make a difference. Yeah. I, it's the, they do a great job. Um, Jennifer, you've, you've been very involved with Roofpack. Yeah, you know, I would just say, uh, you know, we talk about the product side and what's being done um, from that standpoint, but from a labor standpoint, I would also just say, you know, the NRCA Roofpack uh, Pro Certification, all of that kind of stuff, you get out of it what you put into it. So I just encourage this audience and others to get involved and participate in national roofing day in DC. Um, you know, we've been doing that the last couple of years, we get four to 500 people there. It does have an impact and it gives our industry a voice. And, you know, there are, there, there are organizations, there are universities that are really trying to bring roofing curriculum like Clemson University into the fold. And so participate, I, they're looking for educators and you guys are experts out there. Um, and then, you know, finally, the trade schools are a place we're really trying to tap into and encourage folks to join our industry. And uh, we all have them in our backyard, right? And so I just, again, encourage anybody out there to, you know, to get involved because we do get, we do get out uh, what we put into it. Yeah. And we, uh, we gave some free licenses to Clemson University <laughs> for training, uh, estimating on roofing. So we're, we're happy to do that. Yeah. That'll help. That's awesome. I, th I think one of the other big trends that we're, you know, as we're talking about everything today, I, I kind of like like to have my takeaways. And what I'm really hearing too, you know, we already talked about communication, creativity, but collaboration, you know, really working together, whether that's through the NRCA or your local associations or right here, talking about it and working together to try to find solutions. And it was interesting, um, Amy Braybrook has a question and I just, I love your question. Um, Amy, thank you for pulling that in. Um, she, her thing is kind of going back to everything we've talked about, all the, the creativity of new um, products, new different types of systems, technology. And her question was, do you see contractors going back to their first choice products that were pre-COVID and pre all of this? Or are they going, is this really making a shift in how the systems, how they're doing labor, everything. Do you see an ongoing shift in the market? Um, Daryl, you're nodding. Let's I'll start with you. Such a great question. I, I, yeah. I uh, you know, people remember who are with them in the hard times. So my immediate answer would be they're going to remember who supported them during this time, uh, and they're going to remain loyal to them. So uh, I think it's a great question and one that um, only time will tell. Uh, if I had that crystal ball, then I wouldn't have to work anymore. I could invest in the market. <laughs> All that kind of stuff but uh, at the end of the day i think uh it's a it's a great question that uh i think that's something that we'll throw out next week at all of our partners as well too just to yeah. get therapy on it as well to ask him, I mean, adam you're gonna say something yeah i mean daryl said in an earlier meeting that you've moved a ton of your work toward the service side a huge percentage if i remember right just because of everything that's going on and we're we're, we're meeting with a a, a customer a national roofer and they're, I mean, they're changing a lot of their business right now. They're not expecting to go in a different direction after this is over. They see where they want to, where they want to fit and where they want to continue to be more profitable. And so they're changing what they're doing. We're working on an R&D project with them now on how we can help. So. so really the, and to Amy's question, again, that's just so good. It's really about a lot of roofing companies are finding better solutions that they're incorporating and they are changing their business as they're going forward, however they're doing that. And 
Jennifer, I know we talked about this on at IRE, and you, there's actually a video out there of you and I talking about this. But to Daryl's point, it's really about showing up and really being there and um, being at where the contractors are and taking the calls and communicating really strong. What are you seeing on with that? Um, yeah, I think there's an appreciation, right? I think, you know, for, for, for any manufacturer to get up there and just take those tough questions, right? Um, while they're tough, I think people appreciate uh, that people are being transparent and sharing and educating and communicating on like what's happening and what we're going to see in the future. Um, and so, you know, I think as far as people changing, you know, I think this also gave people an opportunity to change maybe even application methods or products that they might have uh, once been hesitant to use, but now they're available and the other stuff's not available. And so you might see a shift, that subtle shifts, right? You're still gonna use, you know, a cover board, but you might use a high density cover board or you, you know, Rhino bond systems, right? You may have been hesitant to use that kind of system and maybe it was more available in your market and you were gonna shift to that. So I, I do think, people may change because the environment forced them to try new things. Um, and, um, you know, and as far as a relationship standpoint, I think uh, going back to my previous communicate, 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 that's, that's all that we can do in these times to, to continue that partnership with our contractors. Yeah, I really think so. Will, um, I would love to hear your take on this, on the shift, or if you see contractors shifting or in staying. <laughs> yes, I think I think they are. I think they're going to continue to look at labor being scarce and uh, more expensive, and so they're going to look at systems or methodologies to install that uh, uh, roof system that can keep them dry, that cost effective, and uh, enhances their profitability. So I, I think that's going to uh, be part of the changes, as well as uh, I think there's still going to be a an undercurrent of a trend uh, to go to pre-manufacturing of things. And in many parts of the globe, uh, people pre-manufacture a lot of, uh, of housing and, and, and uh, roofing and so forth, and they bring it to the job site. And so I think uh, the roofing industry has to, to be aware that that's going to be a trend uh, where they're going to try and control it at a, at a location and then just bring and build on job site rather than uh, you know, construct on the job site uh, from scratch. So I think that's going to be a big trend uh, going forward, whether that's five or 10, 20 years out, but it's it's still going to be there. Um, we we just um, actually, through RT3, we visited Boxable in, um, where were we, Vegas? I can't even remember. Yeah, Vegas. And they, um, it was amazing. And it was exactly what you're talking about, Will, of prefabbing it, a cube, is delivered onto your property and it becomes a house or a casita or whatever you you know and you can build them like legos so that's it that is spot on and again innovation people are coming together so we have we have just i can't i love how fast these hours go and i hate it at the same time because there's so many questions um but i want to thank um kyle chrisman i want to thank mike hicks um for your questions hopefully we got to them um, talking about getting back to work and getting the labor force in there i'd like to the last question of the day i'd like for all of our panelists is i would just like you to share like looking into your crystal ball <laughs> um into 2022 what is what are you top one or two pieces of advice for the roofing contractors? What should they be looking forward, what should they be thinking about going into 2022? And I'm gonna start with Adam on the, the technology front. Yeah, I mean, it's, we're all busy. Um, we're also all waiting for material. <laughs> there's, there's, there's ups and downs going on right now. And uh, the construction industry, frankly, is in last place when it comes to investing in technology. Um, and I'm not saying that just for, for our business, so leave that out of it, but it is in, invest in areas that can help you automate, help you get data faster, get the data you need to make better decisions. That's that's where the investment has to be as you move, or, or competition will squeeze you out. Because without the data, without the knowledge, without the robotics, whatever it is in technology, you'll fall behind. And that's the biggest investment you need to make. That's it. Jennifer? I would just say no one would have predicted where we are today a year ago. 
And so, you know, I think we got into some bad habits as an industry. And um, I think that uh, my advice for all of us is just to protect yourself and make sure you're having those conversations and honest conversations. Trent Cotney has some great resources on the NRCA on how to protect yourself with times like this that are uncertain. We have no idea if there's gonna be another hurricane and if it's gonna drive further inflation and material shortages. And so um, I think we got complacent and, um, in, in certain areas and, and we weren't protecting ourselves. So, you know, I would, I, I do feel that's maybe going to be one of the things that change and sticks is that people are gonna be looking at the contracts they write and the way they, they look at how they do business with owners quite a bit differently moving into the future. Yeah, that's really great. Daryl? Yeah, my, my advice would be stay close to your customer. Uh, go to the customer with a clean slate, listen to them, they'll tell you what they need and then design something that'll, that'll accommodate their needs. Focus on the client. Yeah, interesting. Well? I, I think uh, uh, as we've done, uh, stay close to your suppliers. Uh, our raw material suppliers have been our lifeline and, and allowed us to serve our, our contractors and our, our distributors. And so, you know, that relationship is, is long-term and important and it'll sustain you. And then the next thing is, I think it's what we're hearing today is still going to be what we're going to see next year. So we're going to be tight. So uh, get used to the challenges and uh, become more efficient and and more agile in this in this difficult supply market, which has really uh, grown because we've got excessive demand, and that's all good for all of us. Demand yeah. is good. That That is so true. And, you know, I would also, just on that last piece, um, all of these wonderful, Will, Daryl, Adam, Jennifer, they are all available through their companies, through Roofer's Coffee Shop, through their directories, through information that is constantly being put out there. And I do, I want to say too, to Jennifer's point, Trent Cotney, um, we were talking earlier about earlier about the search for estimating. Um, Cotney is doing estimating training. Um, there is just like so many areas out there, but really going into 2022, the closer you can stay, the more research, the more information. And we try to bring that every single day, not a plug for a coffee shop, but really that's where you got, you got to be talking to all of these, um, all these experts, all these great folks. So I want to thank all of you so much for being here today for your wisdom. Um, we had some great comments on good stuff. Thank you. Thank you for um, everything you're doing. And I personally want to thank every single one of you for being here today. Thanks, Heidi. Okay, so we, I also want to thank John's Manville because they are our sponsor today. You've heard Jennifer again. This is a great opportunity to be able to get with this amazing manufacturer, be able to find information on the site. And I just appreciate them so much for being a part of Rupert's Coffee Shop and really bringing all of this to you today. So, again, Jennifer, thank you very much. And we um, are excited because we just keep the coffee conversations coming and the next one that we are going to um, be having will be on October 28th, um, right before Halloween, and it is where roofs go to rest. And it's all about recycling of asphalt shingles. And our friends at Owens Corning are bringing this to us. They have a whole initiative on um, roofs to roads. And we're going to hear all about that. I'm super excited about that. Um, we're just going to keep all this information coming through and making sure that all of you have it. So don't forget, if you didn't get your questions answered today, we will be um, reaching out to you to make sure you did get your questions answered. This was recorded. So it's on demand. Feel free to share it with whoever you want out there because we want to make sure that everybody gets this great information from our panelists and ongoing on trying to stay ahead of what's happening out there with materials and labor. So again, I'm going to say thank you to all of our panelists for being here today. And thank you all for being with us and watching Coffee Conversations. And we'll see you in two weeks. Thanks a lot. Thank you.